this is a rent video of the recent Chinese web drama Dreaming Back to Qing Dynasty, Meng Hui Da Qing. Yeah, it's not first impression, it's not final review, it's a rent video. Hi, you're watching Avenue X, where a junkie and good storytelling shares their thoughts, knowledge, and occasional weird ideas on stories and how they're told. Maybe we should start to do this in the future. Once you see me actually showing up on a thumbnail of a video talking about a drama, then you know there's something special about that video. I can't call this video a first impression because I've seen this only a month ago, but still, last year. And then I haven't seen enough episodes, honestly, to say it makes a first impression video. And the thing is, I can't make myself keep watching this drama. I've clicked uh, onto each and every episode that has aired up to this point, which is um, 26 or something. So I know roughly what's going on, but literally I have no patience. And I just feel it does insult and injury to my intelligence if I keep watching it, even at, I don't know, twice the speed. Many Chinese drama reviewers have already made a gazillion videos just looking at the ridiculous things that this drama has. I don't know how many people are ranting about it in English, so I just want to share my opinion with my audiences and help you make the decision if you haven't actually gotten into this drama yet whether you should spend your life watching this drama because every second you spend is a second that you are not gonna get back in this lifetime. This is a time travel back to Qing Dynasty in the court ending up in the most turbulent political time of the dynasty uh, famously after Kangxi Emperor the fight of all his sons trying to ascend the throne. Yeah, so it sounds exactly like Bu Bu Jingxing, Scarlet Heart, and it is, because this is based on a novel that was widely recognized as three of the most important traveling back to Qing Dynasty novels of that era. Bu Bu Jingxing, Scarlet Heart was based on Bu Bu Jingxing, and this one is based on Meng Hui Da Jing. Both novels are well known. Bu Bu Jingxing was made years and years ago by the same company, almost exactly same crew as you have with Dreaming Back to Qing Dynasty. It's produced by Tang Ren, it's written by the exact same scriptwriter who wrote Scarlet Heart. And then the producer team of Dreaming Back also has one person who used to be the producer of Scarlet Heart. So naturally people compare these two dramas together because in every way that you can think of, they are like twins. And the result is pretty depressing, let's just say. It kind of is saying for the past decade of Chinese drama land, uh, nothing has improved. Everything has actually regressed, <laughs> apart from technical aspects. Now we have high definition, even 4K, we have better lighting, better cameras, you know, props, everything looks more expensive, better CG, all those hardware department, as I would call it. But in terms of the software department, like casting, acting, script writing, <sighs> Dreaming Back is such a slap across Chinese Romland face. This is how far we have gone back to. Uh, it's just sad. The company Tang Ren used to be the production company in China for dramas that are aimed at younger audiences. It has created so many classics, monopolized the early 2000s, and created the stars that are the most established actors and actresses today in China, such as Hu Ge, Yang Mi, Liu Shishi, Tang Yan. I mean, you can count the names and it's just like impressive that it comes from one company that has created that many super influential dramas that kind of grew up with a whole generation of people. And then in late 20 teens and early 2020s, it gives you a piece of shit like this. It just shows you there's no legend and there's no miracle in this world, you know. You can be the top of an industry one day. And if you are not careful and you are not working hard to keep yourself there, history and time will wash you away like you're a piece of junk on the beach. The only thing that I would say for Dreaming Back that looks good is the looks of things, you know. Pretty nice props and camera work and... Mm, so if you like that, oh, and also the male lead actor is really good looking, really, really good looking. I agree with most people on the planet who have seen this drama. It's like, he's really good looking. Yeah. Apart from that, I literally can't find anything in this drama that's worth watching. And oh, and also if you want to watch it as a joke, like if you want to write the longest vlog laughing at the ridiculous nature of a drama, then you should watch this drama because um, the first five episodes will create like, I don't know, an essay of 10,000 words for you that will be very entertaining for everyone to read. A couple of things that really stand out if you compare it to Scarlet Heart about how bad this drama is, is first, 
the casting. Where did they find all these people that are totally forgettable? When you think about Scarlet Heart, about the prince team, right? That the, so many princes in that drama and everybody is super memorable. Everybody's face, I think back, I can exactly remember what they look like. They all first look totally different from each other. So there's no chance of mixing them in your brain about who is who. Also, they all have such distinctive character. They only need to stand there and not say anything. You immediately get who is about what. And that's such great casting work. Not to mention the lead ones, the four, the eighth, the thirteenth, right? They're just so well acted. Even Liu Shishi back then, I wouldn't say she's like the best actress at the time or even today. Her role of Ruo Xi is beautifully completed. That's due to the script, due to the director's ability of controlling the narrative of the whole thing. And in the beginning, nobody actually believed Wu Qilong can be a convincing number four because he's a bit too old at the time. People were like, why don't you cast somebody is younger, more you know, good looking? But wow, Zhen Xiang, pshaw. Once people watch this drama, they were like, there's no better fourth prince, Yong Zheng, than Wu Qilong. And then you look at Dreaming Back, it's like nobody is memorable apart from the lead male. Uh, uh who is who? Like, I'm into the teens of the numbers of the episodes, I still can't remember who is who. Like, everybody looks like everybody else. Big problem when you have that many men running around in the drama who all look almost identical with their hairstyle. Not helpful at all. Then the ridiculous things that this script has, it just makes you laugh in every Every way. It's like it's written by a Martian who has never lived on planet Earth. Not now, not 200 years ago. It just has no idea about how human and society functions. I mean, starting from the first episode, when our elite female actress is walking in Forbidden Palace, she literally has a phone on her and she doesn't know how to use um, GPS. I mean, she goes around and around until it's dark and then she goes into a room where there's an old lady with a lantern and it's pretty scary and gave it to her and she just took it. It might be like historical artifact that will get you in prison if you take it out of the palace and somehow she got out of the palace. Not to mention later how she got back in the palace in the middle of the night. It doesn't work in China. You can't get into Forbidden City after museum closed hour. I'm just saying, doesn't make sense. And that's not the worst part. That's like the, the least worst part. The worst part is she sees the sort of ghost apparition of uh, Prince 13 in her loft that she is able to afford as a newbie working in architecture uh, office who only just started working for three months in Beijing. Seriously? <laughs> Renting that thing probably is going to cost her something, I don't know, 5,000 US dollars a month. <laughs> that makes so much sense that like she just comfortably lives there and everything is super decorated. And this guy shows up and she runs out, runs to her friend's place and then she comes back. Like she doesn't call the police and she just believes it's her mind going crazy. And she comes back with two tree branches as a cross. I mean, first, I don't know if she's Christian, then like, how does that help? Ghost like person is still in her room and she just sits down and starts working uh, with that thing in her room. Like which part of that follows human logic? Later, when she tries to get him out of the house, she goes to her counter and grabbed a banana and goes pew pew pew. It's the most ridiculous and funny thing I've seen since I started this channel from Chinese Romland. First, what does banana do? Right, like for anything, whether it's a ghost, whether it's a contemporary person pretending to be an ancient person showing up in your room. And if that person is an ancient person, why would he understand with a banana and boo boo it's a gun? There's like utensils right behind her, like grab, I don't know, whatever metal things. I mean, a frying pan would work better than a freaking banana. And when she starts to screaming and tries to run away, this guy just grabbed her and kissed her and then she stopped screaming. How does it make sense for any single woman living on herself in the big city when a random guy shows up in your house? The things you should do is run away, grab your phone, call the police, maybe she scream so the neighbor can come to help. I don't know, any of those things would be sensible things and reasonable things to do. And she grabs the bananas and then she stops screaming because the guy kissed her. <sighs> Who wrote that script? Does this scriptwriter think the audiences are monkeys? When she finally manages to go back to Qin Dynasty, when she gets discovered by um the 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 actual person living in Qin Dynasty that died and then kind of took her place. I mean, where did you bury the body? Why don't you change your clothes to that that person's clothing? I mean, everybody, all the servants from her house just feels it's all fine that our lady suddenly just totally changed her clothes looking like an alien. And then she ends up in the palace because she wants to find uh, Prince 13 
but she enters this thing, right? Uh, 选秀女 which in Qing Dynasty basically means you are in the preparation team for being concubine of the emperor, which means if you actually got selected, highly likely you become your aimed person's mother-in-law. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Not to mention when she ended up in the palace, she just easily walks around as if it's her own place and just run into Prince Thirteen. And when they finally got together, there's a freaking media shower that made them lose their memory. <laughs> oh my god! Like how does that? Work. And later,、uh, things just keeps getting more ridiculous. Like going on a hunt, and there's a bear attack, and <laughs> nothing makes sense in this drama. I thought 2019 has already shown、uh, some most ridiculous script writings and bad character setups and things that doesn't make sense, and it's a total waste of your time in that type of drama. Oh my god, I had no idea that the worst one was at the end of the year. Oh, and then all the female roles in Qing Dynasty have this horrible style and makeup that make them all look ten years older than they really are, and super doesn't help our lead female actress Li Landi because she has a really round face, and when she's in contemporary. Drama with that so bigger volume hair, it looks really good on her. She is the lead actress. Shouldn't the styling team think of some style that will help her mainly, and then help everybody else as well? I mean, there are many ways to make people look better on screen. It just doesn't help that her hairstyle is that. But these are just minor things. I'm not worried about that. If the acting is good, if the script is good, I can overlook that. I mean, I've seen her in stuff that that's been really well acted. But in this drama, ugh. if you have better things to do in your life, don't watch this drama. Unless there's a very peculiar reason that's extremely personal for you. For example, you really want to see how ridiculous it is just for a laugh. Definitely valid. You really like a particular actor, actress. You just love them. You want to see them. Whatever they are in, you just want to see them. Obviously, makes sense. Otherwise, if you're just wanting to tabbing into, I don't know, something that's worth watching, entertaining enough, and not feeling you've wasted your life, don't go into this drama. Do not. Okay. It's like a. It's like a radioactive sign warning. Don't go into this zone. Finally, just one point. I had this chat with a friend who is very into astrology and stuff like that, and we were all both joking about how funny right now, at the end of last year and now beginning of this year, so many dramas are coming out. Period dramas that are focused on Ming Dynasty. Right now, there are two ongoing. Jin Yi Zhisha Under the Power and Ming Dynasty. Then there's another one coming very soon, led by even sort of more impressed, I I'd say, cast with Feng Shaofeng and Chen Baoguo. That's focused again on Ming Dynasty and also on the particular emperors at the beginning, as you see similarly to Ming Dynasty. So we have three Ming Dynasty drama that will come out right around this time. Then later this year, there's another one. Chen Hua Shi Si Nian is gonna come out. I was like, what is going on with Ming Dynasty? I mean, these dramas are made at different times. They should have come out at different times, but history works it. The magic that they all crammed into one slot. They're all delayed dramas. It just happens to be. Showing up now, we try to find a reason from the universe why that happens, and we realized 2020 is the 600th birthday of Forbidden City. It was built by Zhu Di, the Ming Dynasty emperor that you see in Ming Dynasty, the drama. So it's exactly 600 years this year, and Gu Gong Forbidden Palace, now a big museum, has huge. Plans and a lot of things they are designing on their way to celebrate this year of this place being existing in 600 years in China's history. Pretty magnificent. And we were like, maybe it's like the ancestors' energy is like you know this year should be celebrated and let's celebrate it more with Ming Dynasty dramas because Ming Dynasty started. This palace, the Manchurian court, took over when they took over China, become the second kind of owner of this palace. And now we're just like, yeah, the Qin Dynasty based dramas are just so ridiculous right now. But there are relatively high quality Ming Dynasty drama that are kind of cramming in this year. So we're like, maybe it's the universe playing its magic. Not exactly related to drama, but might be an interesting extra piece of information for my audience to know. So that's the end of this ranting video about dreaming back to Qing Dynasty, Meng Hui Da Qing. And I sincerely, sincerely hope that、um, I would never ever dream back to that particular Qing Dynasty that this drama depicts. And I pray for Chinese drama land to be rid of dramas 
as such from now on and forever. Thank you for watching Avenue X. I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, live long and happy drama watching.